Hi guys, good evening. Um, so it's just after seven. Uh, I'm just gonna wait a little while just to check and see if there's anybody else who's gonna join in. Uh, we got quite a number of people who who signed up, so I've had to split that into two groups. Um, it's been way more than I thought would um would be the case. Um, so, um, you know, I've had to split them into groups. So the first group is now, the second one's at 10. But, um, yeah, uh, just please just let me know if, if you can hear me and if the sound is okay. Uh, just let me know in the comments, one or two people, just uh, give me a shout out before we begin. Uh, just so that I'm pretty certain that we are live. I, I can pick up from my side from the audio in OBS that we are live, um, but I've got no other way of um, of checking for certain without having to hear it from you guys. All right, that's perfect, guys. Uh, once again, hello, and uh, you guys will know me. My name is Maynard Manyoa. Uh, I'm, I'm an amateur photographer. Um, the reason why I, you know, I, I offer this course up is um, my my journey with journalism begins all the way back in I think around 2007 when I was just a 17 year old at Alan Wilson School. At the time, I was writing articles for Sunday Mail's The Bridge. Um, over time, that passion for journalism generally evolved. Uh, make no mistake about it. I used to tell, I used to tell amazing stories. Um, I worked in print and online for such a long time. Uh, and one thing that I did well at the time was just write and write and write and write. But with the introduce, introduction of cameras, I got an opportunity to stop speaking on behalf of people and to allow cameras to do the talking for me, be it video um, or be it pictures. And over time, that developed into a very immense passion for, for photography itself. Now, a lot of people, um, the first time that you mention photography, their idea of photography is you pick up a camera, you point and you shoot. And to some degree, they are correct. But for the most part, you know, they're not correct. Photography is got a it's, it's it's way deeper than just pointing a camera at a subject and shooting you can always point the point the camera and take a beautiful picture but if you really want to capture moments if you want to freeze time if you really want to you know grab those pictures that really last a lifetime that make an impact you're going to have to go deeper into your relationship with cameras understanding how how camera how cameras work and everything else so um to begin with, uh, so that I don't spend a lot of more time waffling, I'm certain that a number of you guys have seen this, right? At some point, you guys would have seen this. This is a basic camera. So I flip it around. Mine in this case is a Canon 2000D. I hope you guys can still see me correctly. I see on the OBS that even though I've moved my screen to the bottom, that it's still pretty faded. Okay, there you go. Yeah, that should be perfect. So this is your basic camera, right? Um, quite entry level. This is the Canon 2000D. Um, I think on Amazon, you could get this for like $300. Uh, and on Take A Lot, if you buy it in South Africa through Take A Lot, you could probably get this. Probably fetches for for slightly less. I think you can buy it for the equivalent of two hundred US dollars or something. Interestingly, this is um, a very powerful camera. Now, the first thing I want to teach you is this is called a DSLR, right? Um, I think it should be digital single line reflex camera. How it works is if you open up a camera. Right deep inside, you'll see there's that little reflection, right? It's right in the middle of that camera there. Right at the end of this camera inside there is what's called the sensor. It's what you basically almost see reflecting. 
the sensor is what sees it is the camera's eye um you know when you talk about how good a sensor is for example when you hear people saying uh 20 megapixel uh, or 35 megapixels most of the time they're talking about the actual sensor because the sensor is basically what you know it, it's the camera it what sees it what captures pictures now the second thing we should see and i'm just gonna see if i can pull out something here to just flip this open but if i can't i'm just gonna move this towards my overhead camera here get it to focus right there inside there you would see there's a physical shatter right where my finger right where my finger is there right you probably want to write that down it's quite important because this is called a shatter and after that the next thing because i'm just trying to show you how images uh, how, how the camera works basically the next thing would be this this big guy that i'm holding right and this is called a lens. This particular one is a 75 to 300 millimeter lens. And we'll get that when we go deeper with the lessons, I'll start explaining what is a millimeter, why is it a 75 to 300, what's the distance between the sensor and this, and what it sees ETC. But basically you've seen the camera and you've seen the two most important things, right? Which is the sensor and that physical shutter that I mentioned. And the next thing is the lens. So I'm just gonna remove the lens cap here. Okay, this is called a lens cap. I'm assuming you've got some, uh, you know, very standard beginners who are still learning. And this is the back lens cap. Now, if you look in the middle of the lens, I don't know if you guys were able to pick it from there. It, you can see that you almost see through, right? If I put my finger at the back there, you can see it, right? And why you can see it is inside this lens, is what we call an what we call the aperture basically right in the middle of this lens is a diaphragm that looks something like this right and that diaphragm it can close all the way like this or it can open all the way like that right but that that doesn't matter you know the diaphragm etc what's important which i want you to grasp about that is the aperture itself so i'm going to go ahead and plug this in to show you how you put it in if you have a camera like this and it's a Canon and there's a red little dot here and your camera has got a red dot here, you simply line up the dots and then you connect that, twist it until you hear click, you've basically set up your camera. Um, it, it's a piece of detail that might matter or might not matter, uh, but that red dot basically means that this is an EF mount. If you have a camera like the one that's behind me here, and I'm just gonna fetch it for you. If you have a lens, I mean, like this one, you'd see that this one's got a white dot instead. That means it's an EFS mount. And the difference between an EF mount and an EFS mount is basically, remember what I told you about the sensor. So you've got different sensors when you talk of cameras, right? You've got a full frame sensor. That's the one that you'd get like on a, on a Canon, um, you know, uh, Canon Mark D5, um, you know, your basic full frame cameras, the really expensive one, they've got like a big sense of full frame, it moves around the camera, and those are expensive, you know, a full frame camera will cost you maybe two, three thousand US dollars minimum. Uh, the second type of sensor that you find, which is the one that you find in this camera, and the one that's recording on this camera, is an APS-C sensor, it's slightly smaller, uh, has less sensitivity and also is a little cheaper hence you can get a 200 dollars camera the last sensor that you would get would be a micro four third sensor but we'll we'll get into that uh, uh, a little later i'm just going to pop out some batteries here and shove them into this guy all right so remember we've taken the camera body We've taken the lens, we've connected it. The next thing is if you have a battery, like this one, you open right on the bottom and you will stick your battery in, right? This one's an LPE10 battery, but you know, you could have any camera with, you could have a Nikon, you could have a Sony. After you pop the battery in, the next thing you're gonna pop in is your memory card. I tend to have lots of these, but I'm just gonna pop up one. I think this one's faulty, if I'm not mistaken. 
but for argument's sake, I'll just pop up the next one. All right, put my holder there. Pop in my battery. Now my camera is fully loaded. Lens cap is off. And right on top of this particular one is this mod dial that you can see. All right, I'm just gonna put my autofocus on so you guys can see easier. Yep. Mode on or a focus so right about here you will see there's an off and on switch so i'm just going to pop that up and put it on that switches the camera on now a lot of people like i said most cameras when you get them you'll find that they will be in a and a here most of the time means auto now if a camera is an auto if i point and shoot most of the time I'm just always going to get a good picture. 100% of the time, you click auto, you press suit, you're going to get a good picture. But what the camera is doing when you press auto is it's controlling the three things that I showed you earlier when we spoke about. Remember, we spoke about the diaphragm inside the lens, which I said it controls what's called your aperture, right? Uh, we spoke about the shutter, that physical thing inside the lens that's just in front of the sensor. And whenever a camera is taking a picture, and I'm just, just going to head over and um, hold on, I'm just going to hand over and pull up another card. This, this memory card is full, and I don't want to format it because it's got footage from a function I filmed last week, but we've got lots of these. So, right, so we'll come back, right? I am going to press the shutter button right next to my ear here. I want you guys to listen carefully. You should be able to hear sound. You guys can hear that sound? That sound that you're hearing when I press the shutter button is actually this little thing that I showed you going up and down. As you can see, if I bring it up to the camera like this, you guys will probably see that thing going up and down. I'm just going to slow that for you. Just give me a second. So that you guys understand what purpose the shutter serves. Uh, now, I am going to put it on one second, and I'll explain what I mean in a second. So. So every time, if you're using this type of camera, which is called a DSLR, when you press the shutter button, that little thing, get, thing there goes up and it goes down. The speed with which it goes up and down is called your shutter speed. If you've got a pen and paper, you might want to jot that down because it's one of the most important things in the fundamentals of photography. How that thing goes up and down is called the shutter speed. And it's extremely, extremely important. And I'll explain why just now. Remember I said, when you press and shoot in auto, you'll always take a good picture, right? But you can't, you can't really do much in auto. You're not really a photographer. You're just taking pictures. So if you have your camera with you now and you've been following and you follow these steps and you probably know how to put it together, just move over your dial and put it in manual mode. When you put it in manual mode, you will get a screen like this. Now, on the screen, you will see that there is a number that is written in fractions. Most likely, if you're doing it for the first time on yours, it should ordinarily come out like that. And that number would be, it's like a fraction. One, This is one hundredth of a second, one one twenty-fifth of a second. That is your shutter speed. And you, if you follow what I was doing prior when I was showing you that when you press, how fast that shutter goes up and down is called your shutter speed. And it's got its uses in photography and we'll get there. But this is your shutter speed and you control that. The second thing I spoke about was aperture. Remember when I said inside the lens there's a diaphragm and how tight that diaphragm is and how open that diaphragm is uh, controls how much light is getting to the sensor and several other things which we'll get to. But your aperture is measured in f-stops. And 
as you can see, this is an F11. So if you go with this all the way down, uh, this lens unfortunately only ends at F4.0. Some lenses, I mean, you can get to F1, F1.2, F1.4, um, F1.8, F2, you know, and you can keep going and this can go on up to like F30, depending on the lens that you have. So when it's very low like that, it means the diaphragm is wide, wide open like this. Like that diaphragm I was showing you is wide, wide open. When it's up there and it's, um, you guys can see the numbers from there. If let's say, for example, it's an F32 like this, it means that diaphragm is really, 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 really small. It really contracts. If this was a manual lens, and I really control that diaphragm, and you try to look into the camera from here, you wouldn't be able to see anything. Um, so those are the two things, basically, which are quite big fundamentals. The last thing, because I think I'd say there were three at the first, is this here, written ISO. Uh, in this case, my ISO is on 200. You can have ISO of 100, 200, 400, 800, 1,600, 3,200, 6,400. Your ISO is basically how bright each individual pixel is inside of the picture. Um, and why this is important is the two aspects that I've told you about right now, right, which is your um, aperture, and your shutter speed, they pretty much determine how dark or how bright your picture is. And we call that exposure, right? So if you have a very high shutter speed, your picture is gonna get darker because in the process of taking that picture, the shutter goes up and down so quickly that very little light gets into the sensor. So therefore the image is generally darker, right? I will try and show you physically while I'm here, I'll have to change the lens because it's a bit dark here. So I want to take a lens which has uh, a larger aperture and which means it can take brighter pictures. Right. So I will just head over here and pull this guy out. All right, same process when you get a lens, you take the lens cap off. Back lens off. This one's got a red dot, red dot into red dot. EF, right, that's connected. I'll put that on the lens, right? So, this is a 50 millimeter lens, and you will see if I do this, um, I can lower this all the way to F1.8, right? So, at F1.8, I am going to take a picture of the door. Just hold on a second, I didn't focus. So, there you go. I have taken this picture. And this is at f1.8 and 1 200th of a second, right? So I want us, and I'm just gonna cancel there. I am going to increase the shutter speed to one eight one eight hundredth of a second. Same place. I actually did take a picture, but you literally can't see it's just too dark, right? But maybe one eight hundred was too much. I will go down to one four hundredth of a second. There you go. Still dark, but you can almost kind of make it out that it's the same image. I'm going to go down to one sixtieth of a second. Bang! The brightness is back. Let's go down again to one half of a second. Right, in fact, one third, one quarter of a second. There you go. Remember, shutter speed m one quarter of a second, your fraction, same image, and you will see that this one is blown out.
So if we start scrolling again, 160th of a second, there's my tripod, there's my door. 1 400th of a second, can't see anything. 1 800th, can't see anything. 1 200th of a second, a little bit dark. So the only thing I've been changing there is the shutter speed. And if you listened attentively, and depending on how good my, my audio is, you would have picked up that when it's at 1 200th of a second, it is so quick. It's just like, but when it was one quarter of a second, it was like, right? Uh, let me just check. I see there's a question here. Solomon says, I have a camera, but I'm failing to move from M to 1 25th of a second. Okay. Um, so Solomon, just, just let me know which camera you are holding. Uh, and then I can, I can help you out. I can tell you how to do it. But if you're using a Canon, if you just go into, if you, you use the mod dial and you go into manual mode and make sure you're in manual. Once you're in manual, you will see the shutter speed, you will see the aperture and you'll see the ISO. And depending on the one that you have, right at the front here, there's a dial, right? On most Canons, if you move that dial left or right, it should change that speed. If it doesn't, you might use the AV button. It will move it to there, or you might use the Q button. But just let me know which one you have, and I'll see how we can do it. 600D, or 600D should pretty much be the same as this one. In front of your mod dial, of, of your, this mod dial, there's a little dial like this here. You should move that, and if you move that, you will be able to change your shutter speed. And you can just press Q or AV, you will move into aperture, right? Uh, now, for the rest of the guys, um, I hope you guys caught on, on what I said about shutter speed, right? Um, so the next thing is now the aperture. So that whole time, we were taking pictures at f1.8, right? I'm just going to go back to the base, which is 1 25th of a second. And let's change our aperture to f3.5. And take a picture. You'll see it's dark again, right? If we move that to f2.8, dark, but you can almost see just a little bit. If we move that back again to f2, now you can see. Right now, if you're just changing the aperture alone, and let's say we go back to the f f three point five, which is very dark, right? And you realize that at that aperture, the picture is still too dark. If you just lower your shutter speed, right, you'll see that the previously dark picture can now be seen. Now you might wonder, because I know at this this whole time we're just talking theoretical things. We're talking aperture, we're talking shutter speed, and you're wondering, okay, so why would I change my shutter speed? Or why would I change my aperture when I can just find the perfect one and just shoot? Now, the reason why you would want to change your aperture is because, number one, your shutter speed captures motion, basically, outright, like right from the start. Your shutter speed captures motion. Uh, hold on a second, guys. I see my... Camera has just played a little trick on me here. Um, so you guys can still see me, but I do realize that my OBS has been kicked out. So just give me a second here, guys, while I fix this up. All right, that's easy. Okay, plug in. All right, so my feed is back from the other camera. Apologies about that. I will tell you how that works later, guys, about how cameras shoot for 30 minutes only and then reset. Um, but yeah, so I was saying, you might be wondering why do I want to ch uh, change my shutter speed? Now, if, have you ever looked at a picture that has been taken and someone is walking, but their leg is blurry? Just the leg only. Everything else looks fine, but the leg is blurry. Or someone is running and you look at their picture and everything else is sharp, but their hand looks blurry. 
Um, or if you take a picture of a car and the car looks like it's moved a little and it creates this little blur, right? That's called motion blur. And what happens is when the shutter goes up, the camera starts to take a picture. It stops taking the picture when the shutter goes down. So if anything moves in between the shutter going up and down, that moving object is going to be captured across the image or across that little part that it moves. So if someone is walking and your shutter speed is really low, it's like one of one sixtieth of a second. And in that one sixtieth of a second, that's more than enough time for me to take a step, right? It means the parts in that picture which are not moving will come out still, but the, part, the, the parts that are moving will come out moving. So to eliminate that, you will most likely have to increase your shutter speed. This tends to happen, imagine if you are taking pictures at a, at a soccer game or at a basketball game or a cricket match. Everybody's running. And because everybody's running, you're really going to need a high shutter speed. And if you're shooting sports, I mean, when I mean high, I mean one thousandth of a second, which is like pretty, pretty, pretty quick. I'm going to put it on. One thousand of a second is like this fast. Now, that's how fast the shutter goes up and down. Sometimes you might even go further than that. You might even go that quick. Right? Whereas um, your challenge, or much not, not whereas, but the challenge is once you do that, as I showed you, when your shutter speed goes up, the image gets dark almost immediately. Shutter goes up, image goes dark. And it goes dark because light isn't getting to the sensor and the sensor is what sees. And to compensate for that, that's when you need to then lower your aperture, right? So you lower your aperture to f1.8, depending on the length you have. I mean, I this goes all the way to f1.4, uh, f1.8. So at f1.8, that diaphragm in the lens is wide open like this. And because it's wide open, more light comes in. And you're able to compensate for that very high shutter speed. Your only challenge is there is a limit to that, right? Even if you get a lens that, say, goes all the way to f1, it can only let in so much light if the shutter speed is really, really high. And that brings in the third aspect, which is your ISO. And this is you digitally enhancing the brightness of every single pixel in that image. So you start lifting your ISO, ISO 100, 200, 400, 600, 1,200, 1,600. You increase the ISO, the image starts to get bright again. Unfortunately, because ISO is digital, it comes with cons. It, in, it introduces what we call noise. I'm sure at some point you've seen a picture where a picture is taken, but it looks it looks grainy. You look at the face and the pixels, and they look grainy. They look like someone puts put soil on them. They look you know they look grainy and dusty. That's called we call that noise, and that is almost all the time caused by an ISO that is too high. <clears throat> In fact, with me when I'm shooting, I rarely go above ISO 400. In fact, most of the time I try to shoot at 100 ISO. This camera here right now. Is shooting at 100 ISO. As we speak, it's 100 ISO flat out. Nothing else, 100 ISO, that's it. I, If my shutter speed is so high and the aperture, I'm, I'm compensating with the aperture, and still after ISO 400, my image is still not bright enough, I introduce external light. I get, um, I can't lift this, but I get these guys involved. If I do that, can you see that? There you go. So I introduce that light because it, ISO is just going to ruin my image. It's going to make it grainy. Um, or if it's this image, for example, you introduce a flash. Pop that guy out. You see him? Let's pop him out again. There you go. So you pop that guy out. And he lights up the scene, you know? Uh, but of course, that's got its own its its own pitfalls. So, to sort of summarize, right? Because I know I've spoken about a lot of things in a lot of new terms, right? Your aperture, your shutter speed, and your ISO 
create what's called an exposure triangle because photography is all about light. It's about what the camera sees. If the camera cannot see, the camera cannot take. It's just the same as if I plant you into a pitch dark, pitch black dark room, you can't see. And those three elements are so linked together, right? You increase your shutter speed to take a picture of someone playing football because you want to freeze them in moment. You do that, your image gets dark. To compensate for that, you increase the aperture, you, you lower the aperture, right? All the way down, make sure it's wide open, right? Like f1.8, like the lowest available figure on your lens. And if that doesn't work, you introduce a flash, you introduce external lighting, right? Those three elements, if you have a pen and a paper, you just draw a little triangle, right? Aperture on the other side, right? Shutter speed on the other one, and ISO on the other one. That's the exposure triangle. Those three things determine how bright your image is. Now, I spoke to you guys about shutter speed and why you'd want a very high shutter speed, right? I also want to tell you why you might want a lower speed. Because motion, and I can tell you now, motion isn't always that bad. Sometimes motion actually works in your favor. And I will show you why. I'm just going to pop over here and open my Instagram page. Uh, if you're on Instagram and you don't really follow me, my Instagram for photos is mainman. It's mainland.png. Now I want to show you a couple a couple of pictures here. I will start with uh, let me find a bus for you. Or oh, much rather a waterfall. All right, just bear with me a second, guys. I have to open this in the browser. Okay. There you go. Copy link. All right. Add browser source. Apologies for these delays, guys. What happens is I film and I shoot solo. You know, so if I was in a production house, I'd I'd be able I'd be able to easily, you know, like just move in between places, you know. So I'm just gonna pop this over for you. So you guys can see this, All right? If you look at this image right now, there you go. If you look at that image, if you've seen it, what's the most curious thing you'll see about the water? You'll see that it's flowing. It's got these white things that are happening. It looks really, 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 really nice, you know? And it's it's fading and it's 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 beautiful. I mean it's it's totally beautiful, right? I'm just gonna remove that and go back to here. And I'm gonna open a second one for you guys, right? I'm just gonna pull this off the internet. It's like a really I'm gonna find I'm gonna find a really, really beautiful one for you. Right. Really bright one. Let's open a new tab. Excellent. Copy image address. Just give me a second, guys. I'm almost here. I'm almost back with you. And browser on number two. Okay, there you go. Yep, so I've found a second one for you guys. I'm just going to move in for you guys to see that. And just look at that. All right? And I mean, just look at how beautiful that image is. All right? Now, imagine, or oh, not even imagine, because I'm just going to tell you. How do you take a picture like that? Okay, there's no answers, but I'll get into it. So what has happened in this picture, the reason why you are looking at this water and it looks so milky 
and it's flowing, right? The reason you're seeing that is because, remember what I said about the shutter? The shutter opens and then closes. <clears throat> and what's happened in that whole time is that this water has been moving and the shutter was open, so it's been captured in motion. And what you see there is called blur. It's the same thing. Because remember I say to you, blur isn't always a bad thing because you sometimes blur can be the main reason you're taking a picture. Uh, you know, it, it can be your composition element. And we'll, go, we'll get to composition, I think, in our, um, in our third lesson. And I'll teach you guys about composition and you understand. Because sometimes you deliberately want a blurred image, right? You want to blur that motion because that is precisely what you're trying to do. You're trying to blur because you're trying to create the motion. You know, you're, you're really trying to create that picture, right? The last picture I'm just going to show you... Um, with a with a, with a shutter speed that is so low is this one right this is my image again this is from my instagram i'm just gonna pull it over for you um so you guys will see what i mean All right mm -hmm. so there you go you guys can see it now is it yep yes you can look at that that picture those light orange lights that you see is a train. I took that at a train station in Nottingham. Now what's happened there in the image is I've started taking this picture before the train has arrived and the train has flown past while I'm in the middle of taking that picture. And because it's, it was moving and the shutter was still open, the train has been blurred. And that blur is actually the main compositional aspect of this particular picture. Now, of course, like I said, you'd find that in, in some instances, right, you don't want blur. If you're taking Ronaldo and he's running and or he's about to kick a football and then his leg is blurry, you've ruined the picture. But in this case, you want to take a picture and you want to blur aspects of the picture. So blur isn't always a bad thing. And how I achieve that is by simply lowering the shutter speed. I think I shot that, if I check on my Lightroom, I shot that shutter speed at 30 seconds. So the shutter went and remained like that for 30 seconds before going again. Right now, compare that with your fast. This is the equivalent of going for 30 seconds and then going and in that time, you've managed to capture blur, right? Now, these particular pictures, they're called long exposure. And don't, don't worry about these terms, by the way. By the time we get to our third or fourth lesson, you will be bossing all of this and you'll be able to take pictures like that. But I'm just trying to show you what I mean. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm just trying to teach you the fundamentals because your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO are the fundamentals of photography. Um, I see there's a question that's just popped up. Um, ISO, yeah, so... ISO is basically, I think it stands for International Standards Organization. I don't know why they called it that <laughs> um, or why it is that. But if I'm, not, if I'm correct, I'll just Google it for you. But it should be International Standards Organization. And I, sometimes I can't get the link be between what it stands for and what it is. But basically, the ISO is the center's sensitivity to light or much rather if you're thinking about it in practical terms, the ISO is you individually and digitally brightening up every single pixel in, 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 um, in the image. So if there's a white pixel, the camera is taking that white pixel and it's individually making it brighter, right? Uh, but of course, it's, you know, it's the sensitivity of the sensor to light is basically how ISO works, but that can be very technical. Um, great. And I see there's really a response that says that as well by Chef, and that is correct. Uh, it, the ISO is the camera sensitivity, the sensor sensitivity to light, or the camera's sensitivity to light. And how that works is it's individually brightening up every single pixel on that image. And because it's brightening up every pixel, it's going to introduce grain. Right. So um, we'll go back to what we're saying about shutter speed, right? Now, the second thing is a lot of you guys have seen a picture, right, where there is a picture of this person and they're so in focus. 
but the background behind them is so blurry. And that is controlled by your aperture. And I'm taking it here because I'm sure you'd have said, okay, Maynard, we now know shutter speed. Like, why is it useful to have shutter speed? A high shutter speed, I can freeze motion quickly. I can take a bird that's flying and just capture it in the moment. A slower shutter speed, I want your waterfall. I want this dazing light. But what's the story of aperture? Surely aperture can't just control light in and out. What it does is it affects what's called the depth of field. And the depth of field in simpler terms is simply how much an object is separated from its background, right? And I will, I'm just going to go ahead and open up my Lightroom. I hope I can find an old, old, old picture for you um, that I did do. But it's, it's just basically looking at how, how much is a subject separated from, from their background. You would have seen this that sometimes on your, on your phone, right? Um, you would find that I think on iPhone, it's like portrait mode, right? Isn't it? I think it is. I think it's portrait mode. Yeah, that should be on, on iPhone. It should be portrait mode. Um, if you guys are not in luck, I was hoping I'd find pictures of Stella here because I did take a few. But nonetheless, don't worry about it. I will show you guys what I mean. I will rely again on my Instagram and open this picture for you guys. All right. Main PNG. Now, there we go. So, just give me a second. I'm just going to add, add a browser here. And then you guys will see this, right? Okay. So, forgive me if I'm not cropping this properly and, you know, it's not really covering the screen and stuff. I'm just doing it. I don't have a production manager. I'm just, yeah. So if you look at this picture, you will see that this flower right here looks so nice and it's in focus. But the flowers that are right next to it are so blurry. In fact, there's a black little bow behind it with a tiny white dot. And there's even a house, you know, like right at the back there. Literally, like there's literally a house right there. And you, you, you can't even see the house. It's so blurred. You can't even see the sky behind it. And all of this is achieved by the aperture. So it does happen that sometimes you want to use a wider aperture because you want the background to be very blurry. Now, of course, there are times when you don't want the background blurry. Uh, let's say you're taking a landscape picture and you are taking this picture of this beautiful landscape it's a wheat field you want everything in focus so obviously your aperture is going to be very very high um you know we're going to be talking about f16 because you want everything in the image to be crisp in focus uh everything should be sharp but if you're taking portraits right a portrait is always going to look nicer if the background is blurry so to blur the background it's just a matter of playing around with your aperture you play with your aperture you know um you lower your aperture you open it wide open f1.8 f2 f3.5 f4 you're really going to get that separation between the subject you're shooting and the background and that's how basically how aperture works and those are the reasons you'd want to manipulate your aperture now to then bring it in together right why you shouldn't shoot it automatic every time you take a camera if you are filming sports and you click shoot your camera is going to be intelligent enough to say, oh, that guy is running fast. I need to increase the shutter speed and I need to shoot immediately and make sure that I freeze him in motion. And I really need to raise the ISO because if I raise the ISO, then, you know, that person is going to be bright, which is okay. But you're never going to be able to take a picture of that waterfall. You're never going to be able to take a picture of that train, that long exposure. Uh, and you're going to struggle trying to take a picture like this one here, because if you try and take that flower, your camera is going to think, oh, this is a landscape. And because it's a landscape, 
I am going to put everything in focus, right? So those are the reasons why you'd want to control those three things. So I will just you know, <clears throat> take it back with you guys because I'm... I would want, I would have wanted to move on to the third thing, you know, like take you into focus, into composition. But I think because this was really an introductory course and with the next lesson, I might not uh, host it on YouTube because I might want it on Zoom or on Teams where we can actually interact. And I'm going to ask you, like to say, grab your phone, take this picture. Let's see what it looks like. Uh, in fact, I'm even considering that the next time we have a lesson, I might actually take my camera and actually do it outside, like next to the river or something. And we can be doing it together. Like we can be saying, okay, put your camera in manual mode, do this, put your camera in this, do that. And that could work. And if, if there are any guys who are here who, are, who don't have a camera, um, say you don't have a camera um, or, you know, just get a second phone. And when you get that phone, get an app that allows you to shoot in manual. If you're using an iPhone on iOS, you can get these on the App Store. Unfortunately, most of the ones are found on the App Store. They kind of want you to pay for them, but I think they're like a dollar. So you, it's, it's a little sacrifice you can make. Uh, on Android, you can get so many of them and these ones are free. So that, that certainly is, is, is something to consider so that we really go through these things and you practice. You know, when, when I started shooting, right, it was, it was so difficult because I, every time I shot in manual and made mistakes, I quickly went back to auto. Um, and it was only when my passion was really, really invigorated that I began to struggle because I would want to take a, a certain picture and I couldn't because you start fighting with your camera. I'll take a picture, the camera raises the ISO, the image is grainy because unfortunately, because the camera is digital, sometimes it cannot see the way that I see. You know, sometimes I want to take a picture in the dark, right? Let's just say I'm shooting someone from the back on the window and I just want to capture their face, but with the shadow. Every time I try to take it in auto, the camera is going to say, blimey, that is dark. And it's going to brighten up the ISO. Every single time, it's going to bump up the ISO. It bumps up the ISO. The person is bright. The image is grainy. And yet, I'm trying to go for that shadowy look where the person is so dark. Because, I mean, look, you'll see when I teach you guys about the rules of lighting that, like, for example, there are times when I could want to light the scene like this, right? Let me just do that for you guys. I'll switch these back on, right? I could want to do this. And this is called split lighting, where basically, if you look, one side of my face is lit up, the other side is not, right? And split lighting works in certain circumstances. In filmmaking, for example, it's, it's, it's a very common and very popular method of lighting. So there are times when you, want, when you want to split light. But if you are taking a picture, every time you do that, your camera would say, oh my, this guy's dark, bumps up the ISO. Or, oh my, this guy is so dark, lowers the shutter speed. And then, you know, oh, oh my, this is too bright, bumps up the aperture. And then the, the blurry background is gone. So run away from that temptation of wanting to go back and shoot in auto. Because every time you just point and shoot, the camera is doing the thinking for you. And most of the time, it's doing a pretty, pretty bad job of doing that. Um, I see there's a question... What about professional mode on a Huawei? Does it work like the manual mode you're talking about? Um, I only used the Huawei for like three and a half months. Um, and as long as you can control the shutter speed and you can control the aperture and you can control the ISO, it's some sort of manual, right? I, I will warn, however, by the way, that there are worse cameras out there. Like, there are cameras you can get second-hand for $75, right? Um, but lo as long as it's an original camera, a $75 Canon camera is always going to be so better than the latest iPhone. And I, I have I have one. I have... Um, well, not the latest anymore. I have the iPhone XS Max, right? Um, but I know people who have the latest on the iPhone 11 Pro. And... No matter how good it is, no matter how much they rave about this camera, it's got this camera, it's got that. 
an entry level camera is always going to take a better image than an expensive phone day in day out i will always recommend that someone shoot on a dslr than that they shoot on an expensive phone so yeah professional mode could work uh and to answer you uh chef tk uh as long as you can control those three things you should still be able to you know to shoot and to shoot to, to shoot pretty pretty precisely actually you, you shouldn't be able to to struggle a lot um but like i'm saying it's just that i understand that things are tough this is covid 19 some people don't have gear and you know to start saying buy a camera buy a lens then the next thing buy a tripod buy batteries buy lights uh buy a filter you know uh, buy a neutral density filter buy a lens hood buy this you, you will find as you go that in photography you need so many little things that just pop up here and there uh but if you understand the basics and the fundamentals then then it's easier so that that's pretty much i think i'll, I'll sort of wrap it up at that in our next lesson we will talk a lot about focus and we'll then really really go into the you know the the nitty gritties of of um of the fundamentals, you know, like I'm, I'm going to want you to, to test, but as homework as well, uh, you know, as you go, I would really suggest that tonight, if you have a camera, please put it in manual and put the lights on, please take pictures, you know, take, take a vase, put a vase in front of you, go back, put it in manual, take a picture, lower the shutter speed, play around with your shutter speed and your aperture. If your picture is too dark, lower your shutter speed. If your shutter speed gets too low and your camera is shaking and you can now see that shake, increase your shutter speed, lower your aperture. If that can't work, go and bump up your ISO. Play around as much as possible with those three things. The person who taught me photography, and his name is Russ Bingley uh, at Nottingham Trent University, uh, which is where, where I was doing my master's in documentary journalism, where I really went from being basic photographer to really enthusiast and the tiny cameras he said to me look may not go and take ten thousand pictures in a period of three months <clears throat> shooting in manual mode and looking at what affects what and you will be awesome and i promise you once you understand the exposure triangle and it's almost automatic for you you will find that the more pictures you take the better you get so please as much as possible and i will summarize this one more time for you shutter speed aperture and iso they make the exposure triangle and they are really really critical really critical so woo, um i think that's just that's just about it i will uh, let me see here i see i have i have disappeared that's fine i will come back screen for you guys Yep, so actually I'm back. You know, I should really, really invest in getting a, a production guy because if I get a production guy, he'd be pressing one, press two, press camera one, press camera two, and then do this. I'm gonna flip that off again. You know, and it, it, would, it would be so much easier. But yeah, thank you so much, guys. Um, like I said, I was rounding up before that camera switched off. I, I can't avoid that when I'm on my own in production. I self shoot, so I have to deal with that. So, if you remember DSLR, if you open a DSLR, there's a shatter right inside there. Goes up and down. How fast that goes up and down controls your shutter speed. The faster, the better. All right, more crispier image. So, do it again. That's your shutter speed. So if you lower your shutter speed, it's slower. If you increase it, it's faster, right? If your shutter speed is fast, you capture stuff in motion. If your shutter speed is slow, you get blur. Can you see blur? Yep. Yeah. yeah, that's blur. See, somehow, yeah, I'm being funny, ain't I? <laughs> but yeah, that's blur. This is a lens. If you look inside the lens, you see that? It's wide open. If I let me just see, this is not a manual lens though. But I just want to see if you guys would be able to see what a high aperture looks like. Because remember, I said it's, it's a diaphragm. Uh, 
Still gonna be wide open, isn't it? Yeah, it's still wide open, but right inside there is the aperture, shutter speed, aperture, and then the last thing, your ISO, that's your exposure triangle. Those things are the most important things that you should grasp if you're a camera, shoot it in manual, and grasp those things. And I will I'll take a just a few questions. Uh, if you have questions, please shoot them up and then I will see what I can answer if you missed something. All right, yeah, Solomon says uh, a WhatsApp group. All right, um, yeah, I think that's actually a great idea because I think sometimes communicating via email and SMS can be can be a little difficult. So we'll do that. I will create a WhatsApp group and I'll individually send you guys an SMS um, or a WhatsApp group link where obviously in case you encounter troubles, you can always ask and then your peers can help. That's a brilliant idea. I'll definitely do that. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much. If there are any other questions that come after the stream, because remember the stream is about, there's like a 10 second leg if it's YouTube. Uh, and I'm in OBS, so that 10 seconds, 1.67 delay. So that makes it about 16 seconds delay in between me talking and you guys getting the feed, that whole latency thing. Any questions afterwards, I will answer them back in the comments on YouTube. And yeah, I'll create the WhatsApp group. I'll individually send you guys my number and then we will be able to go through this. I am going to keep this broadcast up for maybe four or five hours just so because there are the people who didn't get the emails or we're getting it now. So um, then, you know, we'll be able to schedule. But all things equal, um, we should in two days time. So the day after tomorrow, which is Friday. I would want us to do a slightly earlier lesson, which is when you can all go out with your cameras and I go out with mine and I put mine on a tripod. And then we take pictures together, like take this kind of picture, you know, deal with the manual, deal with this. And then afterwards, we'll then go into the really interesting stuff because once you understand exposure, aperture, shutter speed, ISO, once you understand how to make an image bright or dark, the next thing you want to understand, and understand is composition. So I said focus and composition. And it's, some are completely different. I'll teach you guys about this thing called the rule of thirds, the golden ratio, the golden spiral. You know, it's different composition elements. There's bokeh. Um, so, but it will get so interesting because then it's not just photography as an abstract concept. We get to a point whereby you actually then learn how to take a beautiful picture. How, okay, I can make, you can take a picture in the correct brightness, right? And, and, and this is important. And sorry if I'm dragging it back. Why I'm saying it's important is, it's easy when I'm in the house like this. When you go outside, you're dealing with the sun, right? That's another source of light. So sometimes the sun's going to make it too bright. And you want to be able to make your image okay so someone can see it. So that means you're going to want to increase your shutter speed, your EDC. And once you get that part, and you're, if you get this first lesson correct, these fundamentals, you will find that everything else I teach you will become a dream. Because you don't have to worry about how exposed your picture is, right? How bright or dark it is. Because it's almost automatic in your head, okay? too dark, shutter speed, aperture. And then you're now dealing with how do I make a beautiful picture? Like which creative element do I go into? Do I want the subject to be separate from the background? Do I want blur to be the center of the image, the main composition element? So uh, that's been a lot, guys. And I've really enjoyed talking to you guys. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm not a professional. I really started taking photography seriously two years ago. But I really benefited from the time I spent at Nottingham Trent University. I had access to kit. I still have some of their gear. Uh, well, this is my lens, but one of the lenses back there is theirs. This camera is still there, as you can see, property of CBJ. So, you know, it's, I really learned a lot, and I'm really happy that I can share this with you guys, and I can share that knowledge, and we can together move from amateur photographers to professional photographers. And like I said, what I found when I was learning was that when I was taught by really, really professional people, I struggled because there's so many terms that they threw at me and I didn't quite get them. But I speak your beginner language, you know, like imagine when talking about ISO, for example, right? Um, yeah, I had the, the sensor sensitivity to light, but 
to make it simpler, hey, it's just your camera digitally brightening your picture. So yeah, thanks a lot, guys. I am I'm I'm gonna end the stream and I'll see you guys in two days' time, which is Friday. And please have your camera ready on Friday because on Friday we are gonna make it a practical session. We are gonna make it very, very practical. Um, we're gonna point, we're gonna shoot, we're gonna share images, and I think we're even gonna do it on Zoom. Most I am gonna try and subscribe tonight for the Zoom. And we'll make it as interactive as possible. We'll ask each other questions and we'll do trial and error. We'll share pictures. So thanks a lot, guys. I know it's pretty late now and it's been an hour.